Hello, and welcome to the next installment of the Spirit of Fire blog tour. Today, we are going to be rocking with the flock. Uh, the fine folks at I Smell Sheep are the hosts for today's stop on the blog tour, and so we are going to be doing a little bit of an interview on video. And uh, they write at the top of the page, and i got to get my pronunciation right for this fine guest star that we have today. Uh, thank you for interviewing with us. Please take a moon pie and grab some Kool-Aid. Bart wanted to shake your hand. So I've got a moon pie right here to go after I've got some vintage cheer wine and of course my favorite energy drink. And we've got some Kool-Aid. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Bart. All right. So I got a little bit of refreshment and uh, man, I'm going to get a sip because doing these kind of posts, you know, you do get a little bit of a dry throat sometimes. And that's good stuff. So let's go into the interview. Okay, let's start with the basics. Would you tell our readers about your series? Why is it called the Fires in Eden series? Well, um, this is an epic fantasy series, and in Crown of Vengeance Book 1, it does have some modern day characters that get introduced, and they get taken back after going into some thick mists into a world called Ave, and they're in two lands that are be about to be invaded by a figure called the Unifier, and, well, actually, forces uh, kind of. Uh, doing his bidding, and uh, the Unifier is introduced as kind of like an enigmatic figure, and the story is basically about how, um, you know, what is going on, how it evolves, how the, the modern day characters factor into, uh, you know, the events in Ave, and, uh, and it gets, you know, it definitely is an epic scale series, ensemble cast, kind of multi-threaded type of style, and um, as far as why I call it the Fires in Eden series, um, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, so all I'll say is that it, you know the the idea of Eden, uh, the kind of pristine, unsullied, kind of eternal uh, state of, of creation originally, uh, that kind of idea from you know the Judeo-Christian kind of traditions um, is reflected in this, um, and it does factor into the the story. Now, as far as the fires, we don't know whether the fires are ne necessarily you know destructive towards those ends of the original state or whether those fires are in the purifying sense as far as uh, something that's more cleansing as far as fires in Eden is concerned so um, so I know it sounds kind of cryptic uh, but uh, but yes um, kind of like the idea of kind of like a, uh, a, a an effort to either go one direction or the other either return to a pristine state of creation or uh, you know to a different state uh, in a, perhaps a much darker state. Uh, that's kind of like the struggle that's kind of uh, reflected in, in this in this particular series, and uh, how it comes out. Uh, you'll just have to read to see how to see what happens. Okay, you have just released book three in the Fires in Eden series, and that's Spirit of Fire. Has the story deviated much from your original vision? No, uh, because uh, like I've always said, you know, when you're getting into a series like this, you want to make sure you know where you're going. So I knew the ending before I even started writing page one, and uh, so uh, so very much my core story is on track, and uh, that doesn't mean that I don't have new threads and new characters that evolve over the course of writing the series, but the core direction um, is definitely, you know, moving towards that destination that I had in mind. So no, the story story has not deviated much from the original vision at all. And um, they asked, uh, which is your favorite character to write from the series and why? I would have to say uh, probably the uh, Trogan warrior Dragol. And uh, He's a non-human character, but he, 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 you know, their appearances, I mean, they're large, brawny uh, kind of race, with kind of like, almost like a pit bull-like face, real thick, you know, short muzzle, thick jawed kind, kind of appearance, and, uh, you know, and they are a warrior race, so they're, 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 they're not uh, very fluffy or, or cute, you know, in terms of how they appear, and certainly in the way they're introduced in Crown of Vengeance, the reader has maybe one idea about what the Trogans are and what they're like, but they really start to evolve, and especially with Dragol, he has an amazing character arc. And just writing, uh, you know, th this uh, character that on the outside looks very brutish and very, you know, in some ways maybe at the beginning like they're the bad guys, and and how his story and how the story of the Trogans evolve and how you learn about the Trogans, I think that for me that's a whole lot of fun because it kind of derives off what I always thought when I read. Lord of the Rings about, you know, I always wondered about the orcs, you know, about nobody ever asked them about, you know, why they're involved or what they're doing or what their motivations are and what, 
you know, what what's going on with them. Just every time they show up, you know, everybody's trying to kill them. I mean, like, the orcs never get a chance to even say a word, you know. It's like, you know, they either, whether it's a dwarf or an elf or this or that, you know, I mean, they, you know, as soon as an orc appears, I mean, they, they don't get much of a chance. And, I've, and like I said, you know, granted, you know, Tolkien definitely intended them as evil characters, uh, but I always did wonder about, you know, hey, hey, what's, you know, what's their side of the story and, and that kind of did influence, you know, in some of the th some of the thought processes about how I, you know, work with the Trogans, and so, so that uh, that hopefully that answers that question a little bit. And um, your books are published through Seven Star Press. What sets this small press apart from the rest? I don't view presses and p the publishing companies in competition. I mean, we're all in an effort to expand reader bases, get people excited about readings. We all like to try to help each other out. Um, for me, what I like about Seven Star Press is that we have a very family kind of environment. Um, we really, the authors really do know each other well. We know the editors, we know the uh, the artists that are involved. Everybody, you know, knows each other well, supports each other well. We collaborate together, we work together well. I mean, it's very much a, a uh, you know, of course, every every author is, you know, of course, you know, definitely you know, has a priority of their own work, of course, but, but they are, uh, it's, it's not a competitive situation. I mean, it's very much... If there is a competition, each author and, and the artists and everybody is competing with themselves, and they're very supportive of the other people that are involved and definitely step forward to do that. So I like that uh, kind of uh, family-type environment, the idea of the rising tide lifting all ships kind of motif. Uh, that we definitely try to foster at Seven Star Press, and that's what that's what I like about it. So, okay, now it is time for the other part of our interview. All right, if every time you entered a room, theme music song would play, what would yours be? Let's go with Rush. And let's go with Tom Sawyer. Uh, some of the lyric uh, lyrical elements of Tom Sawyer I definitely resonate with, and. Uh, I'm very much an individualist and in, in kind of a lot of a lot of my approaches to things and and I just kind of love that kind of just a little bit of a defiant individualist kind of theme that comes across in the song Tom Sawyer by Rush off Moving Pictures so and it's got one heck of a beginning with that big you know real powerful intro so let's uh let's go with that one I think my sister would like it too because whenever I'm riding in a car with her it seems like inevitably that song comes on the radio so we have a lot of fun with that one and uh, during a zombie apocalypse, which fictional character character would you like at your back? Um, I've given this some thought. Um, I like David Gemmell's Drews the Legend. I like Robert E. Howard's Conan. But from the small press world, I have to say that Stephen Shrewsbury's Garias Legal would probably win a fight with it, with those two guys. And uh, you know, he's definitely. Uh, you know, if I see a guy, you know, that's lasted 700 years in, in an ancient world setting that's every bit as dangerous as the one Conan or Druce, the, the legend, inhabits, uh, my vote would have to go for Garias and, and uh, Stephen Shrewsbury's creation as far as who I want with me during a zombie apocalypse. So, you've met tons of authors and actors in your work. Have you ever had a fanboy moment? Um... I never really have had a fanboy moment. I mean, I, I definitely am, am excited when I meet, you know, somebody, you know, that I respect a lot. And, it, you know, definitely what I really enjoyed meeting, like, George R. R. Martin, some people like that. Uh, but I've never had that kind, that kind of fanboy moment where I kind of, you know, lost composure away. <laughs> Maybe I didn't get so excited I ever lost composure or anything like that. So, uh, so I, I don't think I've had uh, what would, I guess, be defined as a fanboy moment. Okay, you've met ton. Okay, okay, it's question seven here. Show us the geekiest, nerdiest thing you own. And I had to give this one some thought. But um, I love Lord of the Rings, and Lord of the Rings came out with a great set of action figures. And as you can see, that's my armored battle troll. And they, they have great detail. I mean, the scale is great because there's a Rohirrim warrior there. And I guess, you know, I guess some people would find action figures to be a little bit geeky or nerdy, but I, I think they're great. And when I was a kid growing up, I always dream, dreamed of having action figures like this. And so when they finally released the series, by God, I collected them. So, so I'd have to say that, uh, yeah, I'd have to say that the, uh, the action figures would probably rate, you know, maybe the geekiest, nerdiest thing that I own. Okay, what is a guilty pleasure for you? Um, I would have to say listening to artists like Barry Manilow and Seal. 
<laughs> a lot of my metalhead and hard rock friends are probably laughing right now, um, but I have to admit that I, I actually get a kick out of those uh, two performers and uh, really enjoy their music, and uh, and uh, so I guess it is my my guilty pleasure as far as uh, Seal and Barry Manilow. So, and uh, and I did see Manilow in Vegas, and he does put on one heck of a show. He's a really really good one. Okay, do you have a favorite piece of art or artist? Um, well, I have, and this is not just saying it, but I have to say that Matt, I really, Matthew Perry, the guy that does my art for my book series, and uh, the cover for Crown of Vengeance is probably my favorite personal piece of art. I just thought it was beautiful. It captured the mystique of the series. It had that mysticism, and it had that kind of fantastical element to it. Um, really, really think Matt just did a great job with that one, and uh, and he's uh, soldiered with me all the way through the series, and so you got it. Got to give him kudos as my favorite favorite artist. So, all right, um, now it's time for the rapid fire. I'm not I, okay. I did not look at what's in this envelope. I'm being about to be handed from Bard. So, so she wants me to Sharon wants to like me to take a quick swig of Kool Aid and accept the envelope from Bart. Let me shake Bart's hands one more time behind the cave troll. Or actually, I'll, I'll move the cave troll away so we can see Bart a little bit better there. And uh, we're take the swig of Kool-Aid and put that aside. And oh boy, I have not looked at this, so I have no idea what's coming up in the envelope. And as Sharon can see, it's still sealed. Uh-oh, and uh, looks like little cards here. Let me get them all. All right. Cinderella or Pocahontas? Cinderella. I, I think I think what she wants me to do is answer which which one maybe that comes to mind first as far as maybe a preference. Tacos or wontons? Tacos. Gilgan's Li Island or Hogan's Heroes? Gilgan's Island. Wilma or Betty? Wilma, actually. Naughty Librarian or Sexy Cheerleader? Naughty Librarian. I know Jess from Jess Resides here will like that answer. Basket of Puppies or Bag of Naked Mole Rats? Have to be Basket of Puppies on this one. Flowers or Balloons? Balloons. Elvis or Elton? Have to go with Elvis. Gotta go, gotta go with the king there. Coke or Pepsi? Pepsi, but there is a qualifier. It's because of the Mountain Dew family that gives, gives it a slight edge there as far as companies go. Sweet nothings or talk dirty? Oh, I'd, I'd have to say, just like the Poison song, you know, talk dirty. That's, a, that's all, that, that has to be my answer, I confess. But I think that's, I think that's all my rapid fire questions there. And um, thank you very much for, for having me on a great visit. Uh, love to uh, visit with the flock anytime. They're always welcome to come here. And uh, I guess I could say, you know, def definitely was a sheer enjoyment. Another another little cheap cheap uh, little pun right there. So, thank you very much, and uh, and I'll visit with you all very soon. Thank you for uh, definitely check out Spirit of Fire and the Fires in Eden series, and we'll catch you next time.